Jerusalem is the Gosnabit invasion. The Romanis are known as the largest minority population in all of Europe. According to national public policy news, they are the most discriminated against socially and racially defined demographic, even in the United States. My name is Sarah Apostle, a Romani activist from Romania, and I have made it my moral duty to advocate for my people, both academically and politically, in order to bring recognition to the atrocities of the past and aspire to objectives for the future. Philosopher George Santayana wrote that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. That is why we are gathered here today to discuss and acknowledge the persecution of the Romani in the context of the Holocaust, while also commemorating our resistance throughout history, leading to the contemporary strive for social reform. If one is to conduct a social experiment in which people across the room are asked to share the first word that springs to their mind when it comes to the Holocaust, most would reasonably answer with adjectives such as terrorizing, cruel, inhumane, and many other terms that could somewhat attempt to fully describe the atrocities that occurred during the Nazi era of 1930s and 1940s. However, if a Ramal person is to be asked to participate in allocating a descriptive label to this historical genocide, they would refer to the Holocaust as the Baro Korashmos, attaching a profound and perspicacious connotation to the experience of the state-sponsored systematic killings that have occurred. In Romanes, the translation of the label Baro Korashmos roughly conveys the message of the great devouring of the human life, a phrase well chosen for the most appalling event in our history. When the Nazi regime came to power in 1933, German laws against our people had already been in effect for hundreds of years. Having a different, different physical appearance from the standard white European complexity, as well as having different values and customs, the Romanis encountered many difficulties in establishing their roots in any given place. Historian Doris Virgin writes that, whether from habit or because of coercion, many Roman were itinerant, and their mobile lifestyle further roused antagonism of others. The rest of European societies labeled them as thieves and tricksters, who used their musical abilities and physical charms to lure the unsuspecting to their room. As a result of these social stereotypes, people started to conclude that the Romanis were inherently prone to danger and criminality, and that communities could diminish criminal activity by preventing them from settling and from bearing children. Social scientists, medical specialists, and criminologists tended to regard Rama as if they were some kind of disease, evident references to the gypsy plague. Many conferences have taken place to justify our biological inferiority and genetic impurity, factors that have led to strengthening the eugenics philosophy and the need to exterminate Romani individuals supposedly due to contaminate the superior and desired Aryan race. This foreshadows the prelude of the destruction and torture of the Romanis in Holocaust. Ten days after the Nazis came to power in 1933, government officials demanded the withdrawal of civil rights from the Romani people. In 1938, official artifacts show that Heinrich Himmler issued the first reference to the final solution of the Gypsy question. It stated that the gypsy issue is a prevalent one that should be dealt with as a matter of race in order to protect the German flood. Consequently, in 1939, Johannes Bergen issued the declaration that all gypsies should be treated as hereditarily sick, the only solution being elimination. In 1940, the Romanis became victims of the state-sponsored killing camps. They faced horrendous persecution growth dehumanization, stripping individuals of any seed of self-identity and hope. Historians estimate that the Germans and their allies killed at least 250,000 European Roma during the Second World War. Scholars estimate that the full death toll may well reach around 500,000 Roma. Undeterred by numerous attempts to exterminate us, we have shown resistance and a powerful desire to survive, seeking to be treated as autonomous individuals with full access to our innate human rights. Despite official declarations and pardons from state officials and international alliances for the mistreatment of Romanis, 
The confusion of formal and informal aversions towards us have still remained prevalent issues that have caused our body to hesitate in terms of being active members of the communities we live in. Over the course of many decades, we have let others decide how the world views us rather than conducting that narrative ourselves in realms such as politics, law, medicine, and academics, thus impacting every aspect of the Romani quality of life. Nelson Mandela once said that, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Unfortunately, the lack of Romani representation in the realm of education has further diminished our chances as an ethnicity to properly advocate for our people, letting others dictate so-called solutions on our behalf. As a result of the shortcoming of Romani representation in academia, non-Romanis have relentlessly theorized about every aspect related to our past and even our future. In the context of education, studies have concluded that, compared to their peers, the educational achievements of Romani children have been lacking throughout Europe. For example, across Southern Europe, preschool enrollment ranges from 0.2% in Kosovo to 17% in Romania, compared to the 19.8% of overall children in the European Union. The number of Romanis as they proceed to higher education shrinks even more. Fear of a hostile environment limits the desire of Romani families to allow their children to aim their state-sponsored schools, in fusion with socioeconomic factors inhibiting such possibilities. As one can learn from the experience of other ethnic minorities that have fought a system designed to set them up for failure, the key factors allowing progress and reform are the power in numbers in representation and a strong, articulate, communal voice, elements that have for long been out of breath for our Vermont people. Taking into consideration that we lack representation in different social realms that require strong foundational education, we have been stripped of the opportunity to come together in large numbers and conduct professional discourses on behalf of our people. In a century that achieves progress through diplomacy and political activism, it is our moral duty to understand how we have found ourselves in such a disadvantageous position and to work towards a better future for our worldwide community. While odds are against our favor, it is the responsibility of individuals that have been able to break the shackles of systematic discrimination to come together in front of officials, displaying our continuous struggle and bringing awareness to the imperative importance of reform. I am the living exhibit of the hardship experienced by a Romani in the context of state-sponsored education. While racial science has been proven to be nothing but a tale used by the powerful, as we have seen during the Second World War, such notions still remain prevalent today across Europe and parts of America when it comes to Romanis, treating us as inherently inferior. From a young age, being the only girl with big brown eyes, deep olive skin, and thick, dark braids in a classroom full of fair-skinned children made me become an easy target for bullying. This opened the possibility of continuous harassment from both my peers and educators, making me constantly feel like a perpetual outsider. I was encouraged to terminate my school attendance for different tactics used by my surrounding collective. From being called racial slurs to ongoing harassment, I have faced them all and there was no system to shield me from such great violations of human rights and peace. I made a solemn promise to myself to overcome all hurdles that have been imposed on my journey and to work hard enough, ensuring that future generations will have a better treatment than I did. With diligence, I have managed to exceed all my limitations and become one of the youngest international Romani scholars of this decade. My determination opened doors both academically, socially, and politically However, everything that I have done has not only been for myself, but I dedicate my hard work to all of our minds that have shed tears and have been made to feel less humane and incapable, when in truth, they have the capacity to deliver fantastic outcomes for both themselves and their communities. Working with organizations such as the World Vermont Federation, Vermont Education Fund, Harvard Vermont Department and the University of Texas at Austin have been pillars in which I have invested to carry out proper aid to those in need. However, my journey does not stagnate without, with what I have currently achieved. 
in its just beginning. In today's society, where the power of the pen is placed above all else, activism on behalf of one's people must be conducted accordingly. <coughs> Opportunities to come together with state officials and make our voices heard are therefore vital, not just for the acknowledgement of our history and the current status quo, but to also bring awareness to the immediate need for action. For too long, our voices have been stifled and our cause disregarded. But as we find ourselves here in front of the United Nations, and the rest of the world, we are able to speak out loudly about our history, bringing awareness to the genocide of our people, a genocide left out of millions of pages of history books, a genocide that still has repercussions up to today's day. Recognition is the first step that paves the path towards progress. It is now the noble task of each individual to take this case into consideration and to add their personal contribution, further paving this road towards a better world for the Romani community all over the world. Romani scholars such as myself and others before me have been able, through exposure to academic settings, to further recognize our people's struggles and engage in proper advocacy with the scope of creating better opportunities in different countries. However, it has not been enough. To honor the lives of the Romanis that have been persecuted and mistreated, we must all come together and find a deeply rooted driving force. I ask you to join our cause, taking a step towards the right direction, mending the wrongs of the past that still follow us into today's society. In my experience, it has been my deep sense of justice that has served as a fuel for all of my accomplishments and all the work I have invested. My sincere sense of right and wrong has given me a reason to not only wish to take action in the face of injustice, but to also aspire to attend a world-renowned law school, becoming possibly one of the first Romani females to reach such heights. An accomplishment as such will set the stage for future political reform and proper advocacy on behalf of my people. In conclusion, we have reached a point where we have allowed others to decide what is best for us furthering our core to non-existent access to education, and consequently, our sense of who we are and what we are capable of. By striving for our children to be active members of society through education, we will acquire our own authentic voices. Strong voices lead to conducting plausible discourse, resulting in proper and well-informed social and political advocacy. We have been subjected to narratives associated with us, but not representative of us for centuries. The Romani spirit is a spirit of strength and survival. And as a people, we are taking back our identity from mainstream songs and stories, moving forward with education and determination as our banner. Let our children be stripped of fear and hostility and let them pay their moral due to our people by providing the status quo wrong. We are smart, we are strong, and we have the potential. We owe it to our ancestors that have died, survived, and resisted for over a millennium. Let us get together and show that their sacrifices have not been in vain. Deja sare sariet, romale ai romale, de deble sangere, tehara si amarogens. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And now, I'm honored to call Mr. Actually, Chief Chase Iron Eyes of the Lakota Tribe to the podium, please. Chase Iron Eyes and Macha. My name is Chase Iron Eyes, and it is my distinct honor and privilege to be welcomed here by the World Mama Federation, Denny 
and Janos and all of the good people, the good brothers and sisters who have survived up until this day. My people, my nation, the Lakota nation or the Sioux nation shares a lot of commonality in your struggle for human dignity. And I want to thank the delegate from the New York City Council for coming here on behalf of the most diverse city in the world. I prepared for some remarks for you and I would like to reference them. But when my dear friends reached out to me and let me know that this was happening, the 80th memorial of such, such heavy times, it was my duty to come here and to present the solidarity of the great Sioux Nation, the Ocheti Shakomi, and the indigenous nations of the Western Hemisphere. I knew that this was a profound moment of potential for nation building and bridge building between our peoples. As indigenous nations, we share a destiny with all of those who seek liberation, sovereignty, and the revival of their languages and respect for their worldviews. We share in that mission to simply live in peace, to seek dignity and to know what it's like to live outside of the dynamic of oppression. Throughout our history, the Sioux Nation has expressed its sovereign authority in many forms, including here at the United Nations. We've championed the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is a lifelong endeavor that began when my predecessors, our predecessors, first traveled to Geneva, Switzerland in the 1970s to press the issue of indigenous sovereignty. This included luminaries such as Chief Frank Foolscrow, Virgil Killstraight, Francis Heecrow, Russell Means, Phyllis Young, and Oren Lyons, some of whom are still with us, but many who have departed, and many others who have carried the coals of our ancient fires. I hail today from the land of the sacred Black Hills, representing the Wanalgi Oyate, or the Ghost Nation, and the legacies of my forefathers, which have survived relentless attempts to erase us from the face of this earth, much like those in the room today. Your presence here is a living testament to our resiliency. Where I live, our sacred sites have become tourist attractions. Our ability to practice our sacred ceremony is restricted in the United States national parks and state parks. We are captives of history. We are a people forgotten. And throughout our history, we've only defended ourselves from intrusion and disturbances of our peace. And I stand before you today alongside the World Roma Federation seeking that peace, a peace that is our sole right and desire throughout. We deserve lives of dignity, just as those who have come before us and those who are coming after us, like the young visionary here, Sarah Apostel. I stand here under the guidance of our traditional chiefs and under the authority of those who signed treaties with these United States. I stand here on behalf of our sacred medicines, our matrilineal authorities, for me, the Buffalo Nations, and the Holy Eagle Staffs, and our confederacies. Despite suffering and perilous policies, and current efforts aimed at our eraser and our extinction, we are still here. We are still here. The Roma people, like us, seek nationhood, sovereignty, and dignity. We have both been dehumanized by the persistent policies of colonial regimes. We must reach out to the world and educate it about ourselves, about how we have been caricaturized, 
how we have been dehumanized and subjected to stereotypes, gross and grotesque stereotypes and discrimination that we endure to this day. These, these are challenges that confront us all and oblige us to overcome. We shall rise above this degradation which we were born into and make it our collective responsibility to transcend that and to graduate from that. Self-determination is the birthright of us all. In inalienable truth bestowed upon us by the powers of creation, we who have been targeted by colonial biases and complexes, we understand each other. We even understand those who have perpetrated that violence and who are seeking a redemption here today. Our shared histories have required us to offer the supreme sacrifice in the formation of the modern nation state. And I stand here today honoring our treaties with the United States, swearing to defend them against all enemies, foreign and domestic. America is our home. America is your home. And we have the ability to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. And that is a tribute to the original nations here, an acknowledgment of indigenous sovereignty and a strengthening of the bonds between us. Let us walk this path together. It's my honor and distinct pleasure to offer my thanks to the World Roma Federation. Thank you for being here, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Ironheist. <clears throat> Let me just say on behalf of the World Roma Federation, and the Roma community. We really appreciate our brothers and sisters in the original nations and in the generous community as we share very similar struggles. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Mr. Ken Casentino, our newest member of the World Roma Federation and also a member of the Roma community. Thank you, Denny. Hello, everybody. My name is Kent Cosentino. I recently accepted the appointment as Ambassador for Cultural Outreach and Public Relations from the World Roma Federation. My journey into this role has been a revelation one that has deepened my connection to my family's rich Roma heritage. Today I want to share with you my perspective as a Roma descendant living in modern America. I am a lifelong resident of Niagara Falls, New York, where my family's diverse ancestry has always been a part of my identity. My mother hails from a proud Sicilian background, and it was through her that I inherited my Roma roots. On the other side, my father's lineage is Celtic, with his parents being of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant descent. In my early years, I witnessed tensions between these two sides of my family that I couldn't fully grasp. At the tender age of 11, my father and his family disowned me, leaving me in the care of my maternal grandfather, Anthony Dominic Cosentino. He was a Sicilian who had experienced discrimination himself, reminding me to be nice to black kids because we're black too. His words puzzled me then. I thought he was crazy. But he went on to explain that he wasn't considered white until he turned 12, a testament to how notions of race can change. My grandparents, Anthony Cosentino and Lucia Galvo, recounted stories from their youth growing up in Niagara Falls. They spoke of gypsies living in our community whose skin was darker than others. These Roma people, as my grandparents described them, squatted in a vacant house and sold their trinkets near the falls. Their stay was brief, marked by a daring escapade that saw them stripping the house bare before vanishing. My grandparents cautioned me never trust Roma people, passing on a mindset instilled in them by their own parents. It was a cycle of prejudice rooted in a desire to protect themselves in a new and unfamiliar land. Looking back, I wonder how my grandfather would react to today's genetic technology, which has unraveled hidden truths about our ancestry. 
This recollection of Roma heritage highlights a common theme, the tendency for marginalized groups to seek acceptance within the majority to avoid persecution. Such stories <laughs> echo the experiences of other minorities, like the indigenous people, my brother, Chief Chase Iron Eyes, who concealed their heritage to escape the brutalities of residential schools. This self-imposed amnesia shared by Roma and indigenous people is a poignant reminder of the parallels between our communities. While Roma may have originated in India centuries ago, our true home is the earth itself. We walk barefoot to connect with the soil beneath us and look up to the boundless sky above. You can see on the flag here. It's important to acknowledge that the term gypsy can be offensive as it perpetuates stereotypes. Just as many indigenous people accept the misnomer Indian, only a small fraction of Roma individuals identify as gypsies. Our culture is diverse and beautiful, embodying traditions that have enriched the world. Growing up, I didn't always fit in with the white kids. Like Sarah, I was bullied by them. It just uh, something was different about me. It was clear that I, I wasn't like them. However, the original people of this continent, particularly the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois, and the Lakota people welcomed me in with open arms and hearts, allowing me to find my place. My experiences have also exposed me to the stark poverty on the Pine Ridge Reservation, where Chief Chase Ironize lives, in South Dakota, and the challenges faced by the Tuscarora, Mohawk, and Seneca people who are from back home in the Western Door. These experiences have reinforced my belief that all human beings have the right to clean water and the freedom to practice the cultural and spiritual traditions without any interference. Today we gather here to strengthen the bond between Roma people and indigenous nations, united by our shared experiences, our commitment to preserving our cultures, and to pay tribute to those who were lost in the Holocaust. We're all one family on this earth, and together we can honor the rights and dignity of all marginalized communities. Thank you all for joining us in this important journey of unity and cultural recognition. I'd also like to thank the World Roma Federation, all their hard work for hosting this important event. I'd like to thank Chief Chase Ironize for being here and traveling here, and also our great Chief Bear Cross of Wanagi Oyate from Kyle, South Dakota, for sending his support. Thank you. And now <clears throat> we will have one more speaker, and followed by her, that speaker, we will have a video presentation for you all, a short film regarding the Holocaust. I'd like to introduce, and I'm proud to introduce, Ms. Dana Mirren. Christian people, Catholic people, the elderly, the disabled, 
and other minorities living in Europe. No one was safe. In a 1948 speech to the British House of Commons, Winston Churchill proclaimed that those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Education is key to ensuring that another Holocaust will never happen again. Abolishing prejudice and racism permanently can only be done with mandatory education, especially for the younger generation. Most of the world today is not aware of the most tragic period in history when Nazi Germany was in control of Europe due to a lack of education. They are simply ignorant, having never learned about it. Still others deny the Holocaust happened because it's impossible to fathom that humans can torture humans in such a despicable manner. Worst of all is the crowd that believes that some nations are superior to others and that those they deem inferior should be exploited, tortured, and murdered. Education is key to ensuring that those who don't know be educated with classes about the Holocaust. These classes should be core and not elective classes. Many colleges have core classes in art and music. Holocaust, Holocaust studies should be among the cores. So much of the time, Holocaust education is given to those who already know about it and feel it, and many times in, in a very, very profound way in their hearts. Education is key to ensuring that those who don't know learn and learn fast, as hatred for dissimilarities is spreading like wildfire in this world. Strict policies need to be instated and reinforced on all, so, on all social media platforms so that racists and haters are not given the ability to spew their words and attitudes of prejudice and destruction. Prejudice is not an inborn trait. It's a learned attitude. Family, school, peer groups, and social media are all responsible. People who are looked up to in society for their celebrity status are currently being given carte blanche to post and say ugly and destructive things about those they are personally prejudiced against. We must combat the hatred and stereotyping that is so rampant in this world by educating the ignorant and punishing the perpetrators. What kind of world are we living in today? Four classes in Holocaust study as well as educational exhibits will go a long way in showing what happens when hatred and prejudice are tolerated and accepted in global society. I specialize in humanistic psychology and believe in the ideology that we are all born with an ability to love and show ourselves and others unconditional love, compassion, and kindness. These innate gifts are realized only in the present moment. Too much of the time, the environment we are living in conceals this potential, and we lose our way as we start to allow the environment to tell us how we should feel about ourselves and others. I believe offering classes in humanistic psychology to remind us of our true Inner greatness is also key to a world of peace, love, and tolerance. Compassion, love, tolerance, and peace begin on a cellular on a cellular level. Each and every one of us has it within us to be at peace with ourselves, to love ourselves, to have compassion for ourselves, to have compassion for other people, to actualize in our potential and be the best possible people that we can be in this world. Sometimes the environment covers that up. Sometimes our environment, our homes, our schools, sometimes grandparents, peer groups. What do they do to us? They say, no, you gotta hate on this one. No, you gotta hate on this one. No, you're no good. No, you're no good. What happens when people are told that they're no good? They start to hate on other people. The second that you are told in your own family or in your own school that you are inferior, you start to see who you can find that maybe perhaps you can consider inferior. It's an extremely, extremely uh, uh, crazy idea, but it's true. It's absolutely true. So compassion, love, tolerance, and peace begin on a cellular level, and that are brought in to include those around us, who then affect others in chain reaction. The second that we are loving ourselves, accepting ourselves, and accepting other people, we basically begin to role model the change that we wish to see in the world. You think it's no real big deal, you know, so maybe um, at Starbucks, whatever, and I let somebody get ahead of me online. To you, it's really no big deal. To the person who you allow to get ahead of you online, that's humongous. That's humongous to them. That makes their day. If that makes their day, it's 
going to make other people's day as well as it's a chain reaction. Positivity is a chain reaction. So much of what we show to others is a model of how we feel about ourselves. Inner turbulence creates outer turbulence. Inner peace and harmony create outer peace and harmony. It's true, what you feel about yourself and saw, you eventually create as your reality and you start to affect the reality around you. I recall reading about a study that was done not too long ago. A hundred people were asked, if you were in a concentration camp and you had a choice to either be the Nazi or the inmate, which one would you choose to be? The vast majority, over 90% of the population said, I would so much rather be the inmate. Why would I rather be the inmate? I'm going to be tortured. Because I do not want to torture other people. 90% of the people asked, of, out of 100 people said, I would much rather be the inmate and suffer desperately. People are surprisingly receptive to kindness from others that they don't know. A year and a half ago, I did what I call the fruit platter study. A friend of mine had a wedding reception at Berlin Ridge Park. By the end of the festivities, we had so much extra fruit left over, and there was a limit to how much fruit you can take home with you. So I decided to walk around the neighborhood, Brooklyn Bridge Park and by Manhattan Bridge on my Brooklyn Heights. I decided to walk around the neighborhood offering people I didn't know complimentary fruit. What I discovered was that 95% of the population was so happy to accept the fruit. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like maybe like 10%, 20% of people are going to say, oh, this is a good idea taking fruit from a stranger. But I was walking around that neighborhood and about 95% of the people were so happy to accept the fruit that I was offering to them. They were all, thank you, this means a lot to me. This means a lot to my family. This, just, this means a lot for humanity. The fact that you are willing to just share your fruit with random total strangers. Only 5%, only 5% of the population that I offer the fruit to, they said, no, oh, please, go away. <laughs> They're real scared. <laughs> The mask wearing population, they're also like, no, 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 don't a stranger, just who even knows what could be in there, poison, whatever. What I learned from this study was that people actually desire open, warm communication with their global family. Time to stop the hatred, the intolerance, and the suspicion cycle. My beloved grandmother, Giselle Freshel, taught me that it doesn't pay to hate a hater. A family she grew up close to in Kiel, Germany, helped her to escape after Kristallnacht in 1938. Most of the family was kind, loving, tolerant, and determined to help her reach safety. In that family, however, there was one son who had fallen in with the wrong crowd and wound up becoming a Nazi, terrorizing others in a concentration camp. This son had a daughter who became paralyzed, completely paralyzed, 100% in an ice skating accident. My grandmother said, and I'll never forget this, now see who's doing the hating. You cannot fight hate with hate. You fight hate with love. We're all God's children. We're all equal. Nobody is superior or inferior to anybody. We are all on an even field here. I learned so much that day about what it means to love unconditionally. We feel ourselves and the world by practicing Thank you, Dana. And now, a short film presentation. I would like everybody to please pay attention and please silence your phones. Um, go ahead, Michael. 